All right, so in the previous couple of videos, we defined what it means for a function of two variables to have a critical point. Um, remember, so this means that the, the gradient of f at a, b vanishes, um, which is the same thing as saying, you know, remember what the gradient is. The gradient is, is comprised of the two first order partial derivatives. So if the gradient is giving us the zero vector, it means that both the x derivative and the y derivative have to vanish at that point. Okay? So that's what it means to have a critical point. Uh, now there's one, there's one condition that we need for this second derivative test to work. Um, we need this function here to be a C2 function. Remember that means that the function has to have continuous second order partial derivatives, right? And one of the things that of course that does for you is, is that Clairaut's theorem is in effect. And we know that the two mixed partial derivatives are equal, okay? So the second derivative test looks a lot more complicated in two variables and you can extend this to three or more variables and then it gets even, you know, it gets significantly more complicated. This is, this is something that doesn't scale as nicely as some of the other concepts from Calc 1. Um, but let me remind you kind of, you know, what do things look like in Calc 1, right? So here's the Calc 1 picture. Let's put it over here just for reference, right? So remember that in Calc 1, if you have, if you have a minimum, versus versus a maximum, right? Well, remember that at a minimum, so this is say the point A, right? Well, the tangent line is horizontal. So F prime of A is zero, okay? But uh, you also have a graph which is curving up, right? It lies above the horizontal tangent. And so that means that this graph is concave up. And concave up generally means that the second derivative should be positive, okay? Not 100% of the time because you could be dealing with something like, let's say, y equals x to the 4, um, where the second derivative vanishes, but it's still concave up, right? But if you, if you stay away from those sorts of uh, degenerate cases, this is more or less the generic situation, right? Um, for a maximum, the first derivative is still zero, but the second derivative, well, now it's concave down, right? So the second derivative is, is negative, all right? Okay, so that's not so bad, right? We try to generalize this idea. But now if you think about what this looks like when you try to generalize, right? So you think about, you know, drawing, what is a, what is a local, let's say a local maximum look like, right? So your local max, maybe you've got a portion of your graph that looks something like this, right? And there's a, there's a maximum up here. Well, more or less you could say, hey, you know, if this, you know, if we're doing the usual kind of, you know, coordinate system, right? Our usual x, y, y, z coordinate system, then this is more or less kind of the, the curvature that you're seeing in the y, z plane, right? So this is what it looks like with respect to y. And so it looks like it's curving down with respect to y, so concave down with respect to y. So you guess that that means that, well, you know, this term here, the second derivative with respect to y, should be negative, right? And if you kind of look at it in the x direction, well, it's curving downwards in the x direction as well. And, and so if we think of this as giving us that curvature in the sort of the uh, plane parallel to the xz plane, um, then we expect this to also be negative, okay? Um, now, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple because you might be dealing with something which isn't, you know, you've got a function which is maybe not perfectly adapted to this like XYZ coordinate system. Um, 
And, and, and sometimes this cross term can play a role. So it turns out that just checking to see if, if these two are negative, so if, you, know, you might think if they're both negative, yep, definitely a max. If they're both positive, kind of the other way around, definitely a min. And you might think that that works out, but it turns out that that's not quite right because sometimes this mixed partial derivative comes in and if this, if this makes a significant contribution, it screws everything up for you. Um, so here's what the second derivative test actually says, okay? So we'll state this as a theorem. Well, it's going to be a lazy theorem because I'm not going to write down all my conditions. The conditions are over here. We've got a function. It's got to be C2. We've got to be at a critical point. And we've got to have these values A, B, C, D defined as you have over here. Okay, so with that preamble, we can state this solution. If, um, if this number D is positive, and if A is positive, then F has a local minimum, okay, at that point, at AB. If D is positive and A is negative, then F has a local maximum at AB, okay? Um, if, if this D is negative, F has what's called a saddle point. at AB, okay? Um, the, the, the saddle point terminology comes from, you know, this, this hyperbolic paraboloid, this, this object, right, that looks something like this. Um, because, you know, there is a saddle point there on that hyperbolic paraboloid. Um, let me try to, you know, draw this thing so it looks reasonable, right? Um, so what's going on at a saddle point is, is you have one direction in which you're, you're concave up, so you kind of have a, looks like a minimum in one direction. But if you look in another direction, you've got a maximum, right? So, so this is the idea of a saddle point, right? You think about a horse's saddle, right? It curves up in one direction and it curves down in another direction. Um, so it's neither a minimum nor a maximum. Um, and the, uh, the other one, I won't even bother writing it down. There's the, the fourth possibility is that this value d is zero, okay? And if d is zero, the second derivative test fails. Just like in one variable, if f double prime is zero, the second derivative test fails in that case as well, right? Um, and, and it's kind of the same story. So if, if f double prime is zero in one variable, or if this d is zero in two variables, these are what are called degenerate critical points. Um, they're, they're ones where, um, Things aren't quite sort of the normal situation, and you have to treat them with a little bit more caution to understand what's going on. Um, before we wrap this up, and we should wrap it up, we're, we're coming up on 10 minutes, maybe nine minutes. Let me, let me say something, I mean, it's hard to kind of grasp why this makes sense, right? You can, you can kind of play around with the values and think about it, and you, you, you can make sense of this, that, uh, well, if D is positive and A is positive, right? Well, because this term here is always negative, certainly if A is positive, C has to also be positive if you want D to come out to be positive, right? Um, so A and C do have to both be positive, and, and you are in this situation where you're concave up in both the X and the Y directions, and that's what you expect to see at a minimum. Similarly, uh, if D is positive and A is negative, right? So if A is negative, the only way D can be positive is if C is negative as well, um, in which case you have, you know, concave down in, in both directions and you have a maximum. So this is reasonable, right? Um, 
And certainly if, if A and C have opposite signs, then D is going to be negative and you have something that looks like this saddle point, right? If, if you're curving up in the y direction and down in the x direction, that's exactly what you should expect things to look like. Um, but, you know, the, the ones that are, you know, the situation that's maybe slightly more subtle that you have to think carefully about is that it could also happen that A and C have the same sign, but in absolute value, they're not as big as B, right? So like if A was two and C was two, but B was equal to three, then AC minus B squared is still gonna be negative. D is gonna be negative. You still have a saddle point, even though you're curving, you know, let's say upwards in both the X and the Y directions, you might still end up with a saddle point, right? Um, if you wanna understand why this is true, um, it kind of, it, it's, you extend the thinking that you do in one variable. So in one variable, the reason why this works is tailored polynomials, right? So we know that in one variable, and, and actually now you've been through Calc 3, you know you can even talk about Taylor series, right? And so you know that f of x, you could write as f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a, and then f double prime of a over two x minus a squared plus higher order terms. And, and then more to the point, if you're at a, you know, if this is a critical point, right, f prime of a is zero, then that term is gone because you're at a critical point. And this is just a constant. This is a parabola, right, x squared, it's a quadratic, right? And, and so if you ignore all the higher order stuff, then near your, and, and you can, if you're sufficiently close to a critical point, you can ignore the higher order stuff, it's some error term. Um, you have something which is approximately quadratic, right? And in one variable, quadratics open either up or down, and the thing that determines whether it opens up or down is the sign of this term, and that's how the, why the second derivative test works. If you're, if you're in several variables, you can, do, you can do a similar thing. You can do a Taylor expansion, and we don't really talk about Taylor polynomials in this course, um, it's kind of unfortunate. They're sort of cool, but it, you know, there's only so many things you can cram in. Uh, well, the Taylor polynomials look something like this, right? So here's your here's your linear term, right? Here's your if you stop there, that's your linear approximation. But then you can go on to quadratic, right? So now you can move on to quadratic, and you get something that looks like this, uh, one half x, x, f x x, x minus a squared plus f x y at, uh, sorry, a b, x minus a, y minus b, and then f y y times y minus b squared, one half out front, Okay, you have something that looks like that. And, and just like we had over there, if we're at a critical point, this is zero, this is zero, so that's gone, that's gone. Um, and, and so you have something which looks like, right, here's an x squared term, an xy term, and there's a y squared term. What you have is something which near a critical point is approximately a quadric surface, right? And in fact, approximately a paraboloid. So what you're really trying to decide here is, is what kind of paraboloid do you have? Is it uh, a, an elliptic paraboloid opening up, elliptic opening down, or is it a hyperbolic paraboloid? Which of those three scenarios are you in? And because you have this cross term, right, this is where you have to deal with this. There's this cross term, which means that your paraboloid might be rotated with respect to the coordinate system. Um, and, and if you really want to understand how to kind of unpack that rotation and see how things are going and, and understand your critical point, um, well, there, there's a thing you can do, which is that you can kind of arrange these values in like a symmetric two by two matrix, A, B, C. Let's not get into it, but um, if you take that matrix, you diagonalize it, um, you can figure out what's going on. And actually, this is an argument that you can generalize. Um, 
if this is if this is something that you find sort of interesting, I did put some details in the textbook in one of the later sections. It's totally optional material. But if you if you want if you want to understand what's happening, you want to understand why the second derivative test works. Um, there's actually some some linear algebra going on under the hood, and it's really like orthogonal diagonalization, right? Which is I think kind of cool because you see this in 1410, and you don't really understand what use it really has. Um, here's, and okay, it's an application to another math class, so maybe that's not an application, but uh, certainly it plays a role. Um, it, is, it is sort of a significant thing. It helps you understand what's, what's going on in this scenario. Um, all right, uh, enough of the technical stuff. Let's do one more video where we actually put this theorem to the test and, and classify some critical points. And, um, and then we'll only have one more topic left for this chapter, which is, uh, you know, um, absolute max and min values.